I think in India there are many people who have the ability to do more than what they think. So this person then finally got into Wharton. He was an addict, so he had four years of his life which was blanked out, where he was simply living in dumpsters and uh, so the failure also turned out to be an opportunity. And I had to interview 70 or 80 times to get my first job. But overall, I think the Indian consulting market performs on average better than the US consulting market. I like to work with people who are either in trouble or they have uh, potential but they are not realizing it. Or if they are a reapplicant, because like even I was a reapplicant. Hi, I am Shweta Gudnani Singh, and in conversation with me today is the famous Rajdeep Chimney, the man behind admissions gateway, ranked number one for several years as the top MBA consultant in the world. Um, Rajdeep, we are very excited to talk about life, life for an admissions consultant, and MBA applications, stress management, your favorite stories, and so much more that we have in store today. Sure, happy to talk about all of that. Rajdeep, there are so many people who want to know, how did you get to Kellogg? What was your journey like? So my Kellogg journey, somehow growing up, I always knew I wanted to do an MBA. Uh, but I was a very average kid in terms of academics and stuff. So I had to take a long way. I first did a BCom. And then after BCom, typically you don't get good jobs in India. So then I did a computer science masters. And then that set me up to work for a few years and do an MBA. But in hindsight, like for some reason, which I can't explain, I always wanted to do an MBA from outside and the other stuff I was sort of doing so that I could get there, more or less. So an MCA from IMT Ghaziabad was profile building for you? Uh, it was profile building plus avenues are less. Like if you, unless you're from the top colleges, IIT or SRCC or something, I guess you have campus recruitment, etc. But like I went to Davie College, so no recruitment as such. Um, so I guess studying is the next thing, but I didn't want to do an MBA straight after because that would exhaust my opportunity to do another one. Well, not exhaust, you can still do a dual, but I just thought I'll do something else and then I'll get a complementary skill set between sort of computer science and business. So you went to Kellogg, you have an M7 MBA. Then how did admissions consulting happen? So before that, going to Kellogg was a long... Uh, journey like I applied one year and I was rejected from all the schools what had happened was that I had a 750 on my GMAT uh, but it expired so I gave my GMAT again and then I got a 690 oh. but I was generally confident in my profile because I had worked in Europe and some other things so I applied but like it I couldn't override the con part of the application so then I gave my GMAT again <clears throat> and then I got a 750 again which was by chance the second time because uh, once you start working progressively more difficult than from college to give the GMAT. Uh, then I applied again. Uh, then I was waitlisted at Kellogg. Mm -hmm. And then in about June of that year, I got into Kellogg. So it was a two year road. Um, and that informed much of what I did in terms of my consulting now. So that journey in hindsight, it was a failure, etc. But it helped me and also in some subconscious way pointed me towards this gap of people applying and what help they are. So this is really nice to know. That means you, you've experienced it firsthand. What it is like to take the GMAT as a working person versus a college student. You've experienced the pain of the reapplication. Uh, you've experienced the pain of a wait list. That's yeah. what helped you grow. Yeah, so actually I think... Uh, <clears throat> Well, failure <coughs> excuse me, is generally a good teacher as long as you're not too hung up on the failure, right? So, um, <coughs> so when I got into Kellogg and if I hadn't failed that first year, like I wouldn't have thought that there is any gap or there's even this space of admissions counselling. Of course, it existed then, but for me individually, there would have been not much motivation to sort of do it. Uh, so the failure also turned out to be an opportunity. <coughs> And then I went to Kellogg and I had to interview 70 or 80 times to get my first job. And then I got my first job, but I lost it in a week because it was the housing crash and they laid off people before we even joined. Um, so again, that was a failure again. 
so that changed my trajectory from sort of maybe doing a corporate job to sort of doing something like this so when you're failing it's like uh, not a good experience and you're hyper about it but in hindsight if you don't fail then it would have taken me somewhere else and now i feel like okay i'm better off because of that inflection took me this way so you started consulting straight after kellogg uh i started my first year at kellogg it was more uh, it wasn't a formal thing it was more a thing of just helping a few people and i was basically supplementing pocket money i guess um then i worked in the bay area for two years uh tech product management microsoft ecosystem channel partner and then uh, okay then again i didn't get my h1b <clears throat> so in most people's life that is also a point where people are hyper and very stressed out so that actually resulted in me coming back to india um <clears throat> then in india it was actually at that point difficult to find a job so i think uh, and i always put this in context when i came for my first job post kellogg to india i think i was offered a 18 lakhs package and this is what people get out of college more or less now or even double this right so so it wasn't a good starting point but luckily i didn't take it like there was this mba gives you this confidence that okay we'll hang back and we'll see what plays out and we'll explore so as part of that exploration this happened so then i became an admissions consultant yeah so initially you started consulting individually yeah so what made you form a team what made you create admissions gateway yeah well couple of thing happens one is as a individual consultant i guess you have some aspirations of and then i met those more or less like those are more like hey listen they start with can i help somebody get in <clears throat> they maybe start with some financial situation could be maybe hey listen can we help people get into harvard stanford then could be hey listen can we be a little internationally known then maybe a hey, okay, can we be like whoever was ranking consultants can we be up there in that so one thing is like i was on that trajectory a little but i am always more partnership minded so um i had started working with people or developing other people etc and the idea is you simply can help more uh, people like that so individually maybe if you really just stop doing anything else you can work with 30 35 40 people uh, but in a firm you can work with like even 200 people and provide a good quality of service and that way you make more of an impact on more people and the other thing is like uh, once you have some life work then you don't want it to stop when you stop mm. uh, so with the individual the problem is that the day you hang up your boots everything that you've done just vanishes right um in this way at least the other people who are growing and <clears throat> like the firm can carry on for 10 15 years uh, even though you may carry on for only 5 7 years mm-hmm. so i think that's also a advantage of more going the firm model but now you're like 6 years running ranked number 1 um we yeah, are 5 or 6 i guess so does that bring in a lot of weight of expectations how do you cope with this um no not as such so one thing is that ranking is not like a i mean if a chief minister everybody knows your chief minister these rankings are more like some people know about them etc right so it's not a is not a pervasive thing so it's not that people come with that expectation that some magic is going to happen um from my side i'm fairly chilled out so i like it's all on the merits of what can be done and what the student wants and all that i don't think the ranking plays into it or students come thinking that something beyond the like something extraordinary will happen just because so we add value but at the end of the day it is basically a relationship between us and the student the student is 24 years into their experience we are coming for about 6 months so it's also them pulling their own weight it's not just the counselor so to speak yeah do you think the counselor working with the aspirant has the uh, power to influence the person into being less stressed out and more chilled <laughs> sure. the consulting aspect <clears throat> um, how much does it add to the pressure that the aspirant is already facing the pressure thing is a little strange because basically your advisor is a little ahead of you so in hindsight it's very easy to say hey listen this is fine it'll work out and you should chill but you are going through that and in fact when your advisor was going through that they were also stressed so 
this dynamic is there but for me if i look back in hindsight <coughs> at any point in my life that i thought i'm in deep trouble now in hindsight i wasn't in so much trouble it was just in the moment like a magnification because my like my focus was just that thing so if i'm looking for a job out of kellogg and i don't get it it's like oh, okay now everything's finished now what will i do and all but like i said it turned out to be a good thing um so you should generally try to control what you can control and not stress about it india there is too much stress because we are very brand focused we are very aspirational is good but we are over aspirational and like i don't know there's a middle ground between aspiration and working whereas if you aspire a lot but you are just stressed out and you can't work then the aspirations also not worth anything so it's a balance and you need to keep going through the whole thing so that you plug on and that's it so when you got that 690 on the gmat why do you think that happened because that's something we battle every day we see working people under so much pressure high aspirational uh, aspirations they create stress they are under stress sometimes they say oh the application deadline is on my head there are so many triggers and i feel that it directly impacts how they perform on the exam did you go through something like that um no i think it was more just i lost touch with uh, studying because once you're in college you are used to studying and then 3 or 4 years after college you are trying to restudy uh so in that sense you should give your gmat more or less out of college only you have the runway um <clears throat> and that's the best point uh you're not working at that point you don't have any family or financial obligation you don't have any bosses like you can just concentrate and knock out one thing i think later on there are multiple pulls so even if you are not stressed but you still have to be a very good time manager later on college is sort of the easiest time to do your exams and things like that yeah so rajdeep who in india today should think of doing an mba that's one two why should you do a global mba why not an indian mba okay i did the mba because i needed to create a inflection point so what that means is that i had done my b bcom and then i did a mca <clears throat> and then i joined a job so basically at that point maybe i was earning 30000 of 30 35000 a month so for me it was a question that if i seriously continue on this path like i didn't think that was enough for where i wanted to be etc so the mba was what gave me the inflection point to sort of go and start a new and then get a big jump <clears throat> now the other thing i could have done is a ms in computer science but that was just a call between me wanting to be more technical or me wanting to be somebody who is more sort of business minded but can talk to technical people so i didn't want to be overly technical so i didn't do the ms and hence i went for the mba uh so the re- like you should know the reason that you're going for the mba some people go for the education some go for the network some go for the inflection in job some go for the geographical shift so for me it was more the inflection because i didn't see any path in india where i could have and more it comes from your start like since i was above average i was in a above average position but i wasn't brilliant so it wasn't like i started at mckinsey or sequoia or something where i have a option of just continuing right uh, so the mba was sort of the leveling field and the indian versus us mba now Okay, Indian MBA is typically less work experience the cohort has, except for maybe ISP, but ISP also. So the American MBA is much more practical in that sense. They're more, much more experiential. ISP is sort of a American model MBA in India, right? So it's like a bridge between Indian MBAs. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> exit opportunities from the US are much better. Of course, the cost is a little bit more, but then your upside is also much more. and third thing is you get geographical play right like if you go to the us you can work in the us or london or hong kong singapore india uh but at least if you go to isb more or less you're going to work in india only um so i think these are mostly the reasons for the us mba and then brand perception and all those other intangibles are there um so i'm a big advocate of us mbas if you can but if your lifestyle uh financials or family sort of ties are deep then the indian mba is also help the other thing is very hard to get into an indian mba so <clears throat> like getting into iim is much much tougher 
than if you were trying to get into say Wharton. Oh really? So because of demand supply, because of also it's keyed on just your ability as a test taker, right? Right. And the US MBAs have they look at your extracurriculars, they look at your life story, etc. So in that sense, they're more objective. And these folks are more like, hey, listen, 99.2% is a cutoff and all of that. So you may have the ability to go, like I got into Kellogg, but I don't think I have the ability to get into IMA or IMB. So by that way, like your best option also is in the US many times. So uh, in hindsight, uh, if you had to give advice to your 20 to 25 year old self, what would it be? Um, Actually, I think I handled my situation fairly okay because basically I didn't have a, I had a very different experience of from most people going to a top MBA. So basically what ended up happening was that most of my colleagues went to Goldman or McKinsey or wherever. And basically I got some job where I was just hanging on. So at that point, like there's this comparative in your mind that, hey, listen, I was with the same people and these people are doing very well and... I'm not doing so well and all this, right? So, but now when I look back and somebody's doing a comparative that, okay, my friend got into Harvard, I got into only Kellogg. Now I dismiss that comparative now. Though I used to do it then because in hindsight, I realized that over 10 years, it just evens out, right? It's not a big deal. Um, so losing my job was stress. Uh, losing my H1B, like not getting an H1B was stress. So I guess I just internalized stress. And the other thing that happened is the first couple of times stress came, after a year I was fine. So once you do it twice, you just see the pattern that, hey listen, it's anyway fine, so what's the point of stressing now? Is that why you're such a chilled out person? Yeah, maybe. That's what you're famous for. I stress less. I tell other people also to stress less. Well, you can stress about a tangible thing. Like if I have cancer, I'll stress. Like, I mean. But if I'm just stressing about, hey, listen, I got into Kellogg, but not water, and it's an irrelevant thing. So, like, it's okay to stress about serious stuff, but you should be able to filter what is serious and what is not so serious. Now that you said Kellogg versus Wharton, <laughs> yeah. how should applicants decide which schools to apply to? That's, that's the number one question we face. Okay, that's very tricky. So, first thing is, what are you trying to achieve? So, some people come in and they're not trying to get into MBA. Mm they are basically trying to take some shots. And they're like, hey, listen, we'll go into only Harvard, Stanford or Wharton. And their opportunity cost is high. So they say, hey, listen, I work in this private equity firm. I make X crores. And so I'm thinking that I'll go to Harvard, otherwise I won't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So this is fine for me. Like at this point, it's not an assessment of whether they can get into Harvard. It's just that their mindset is, hey, listen, this is short taking. And we're not trying to get an MBA. We're just trying to go to Harvard, otherwise it's fine. Then comes the other category of people. They actually want to go for an MBA. Now you transpose this to somebody who is, uh, say, making 20 lakhs in a job. And they come and say, listen, I'll do HSW or BUST. Uh, so that shouldn't be the case because the opportunity cost is very low. So if they go to Kellogg or Booth or Columbia or Tuck or Duke or Yale or Ross or LBS, their inflection over the short term as well as over 20 years, they will be beating their current trajectory. Mm -hmm. So my advice to people is you solve for your life problem, not for a brand scenario. So you can have both type of people, people who are taking shots, but they're very happy with their life situation. And people who want to do an MBA should have a more practical approach to what they're doing. So if people who are working for a private equity firm or a big four consulting and they're actually making big money now, sure. can they continue with that lifestyle if they don't do an MBA? Or there will come a point where they burn out, there'll be a point where the company feels we want newer blood in the system. I'm sure, okay, at least they have the option because basically what they're thinking is that we have a serial trajectory. Now, there may be some bumps where McKinsey may say, hey, listen, after this period, we need an MBA. Or the PE firm may say, hey, listen, it's two years and then you need an MBA, etc. Right? So, at some point, they may have to do the MBA, but still their optionality is much more. I think it's for people, okay, it depends on your aspirations. Like for me, I was basically solving for better work, uh, better network and more uh, better financials. And better thought process in terms of upside. Like I think once you go to an MBA, you, 
like you're comfortable being an admissions counselor. I'm fine with that. Like, but when I came back to India, many people said, oh, uh, my aunt also does this. Or somebody said, oh, in CP, there's a guy who sits in a small khokha. He also does this. And then they said, oh, you're from Kellogg. So why are you doing this? So I think the MBA allows you to be a little bit more on the edges because you know that your bottom is capped. So you can experiment, you can do what you feel like, etc. So in doing that, then it works out finally if you just keep at it. Yeah. Rajdeep, you got married after you started doing admissions consulting. Yeah, so I started while uh, I was in Kellogg and then formalized when I came here. So I got married in 2012, about two years after. So when I was getting married, of course, it's not a traditional job. Like I think the <clears throat> thing has changed now. People see this as an industry. At that time, it was more like a freelance thing. So I had warned someone that, hey, listen, the scene is like this and there's a lot of uncertainty. So how did marriage help you grow? And uh, what role did uh, the support from your spouse play in setting up admissions gateway? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> one thing is you take a lot of time out from family life and you put it in any business that you're doing. <clears throat> so then the family has to sort of be comfortable and support that. Um, so we did that in the early stages. Now I'm trying to more rationalize, spend more time with the kids. Uh, but it's still difficult because this is not like an office hours type business. People call all day, many people call. Um, so just more practicality in terms of having some time out, spending more time with the kids rather than just keep doing counseling. So many people don't know this. Rajdeep is a doting dad and he's a very, very big family man. So how has the work life changed after kids? Well, okay, to be frank, I have some participation with the kids, but uh, like my wife would have, summer would have tenfold. <clears throat> so that's also there, like in terms of, uh, like if I had to do the whole thing myself, it would not be possible to do anything at all. Um, and then sort of in the evenings, it's my time to, okay, maybe play cricket or football or get some stuff done with the kids. Um, but otherwise, like that sort of, very important that we are both able to make time when somebody is with the kids and then the other person is doing something else. So given the hours of work and how involved you are with your clients, yeah. do you get time <laughs> for your hobbies? Do you get time to socialize? So clients are all over the world. So that makes it a little difficult because you have uh, the US <clears throat> different hours, India different hours. But overall now we are used to it. So yeah, we get enough time to socialize. Hobbies are mostly cycling, reading, I play a lot of poker once a week. So that we managed to do. Uh, September, this August, June, July, these four months are very heavy, but otherwise there are some lean periods where you can sort of catch up on everything else. So I believe you travel a lot. <clears throat> we try to. Uh, it's become less with the kids because they don't eat, so we don't know where to take them. <laughs> you have to take their protas along with them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we try to travel once a year. So what are you reading now? Read? I read all kinds of stuff. My uh, granddad was, uh, he was the director of the CBI long back. So when I was a kid, I was very interested in, of course it's not spying, but as a kid I used to think his job is <coughs> spying, which is more I guess raw, not him. But uh, But that got me reading all types of thrillers, spy fiction, even more uh, real, like autobiographies and all. And then of course, now I read a lot of business books. Um, so anything to do with uh, scaling a business, habits, managing money, that usual boring stuff. <laughs> so what books would you recommend to a 25 year old today? To a 25 year old? Well, uh, okay, this uh, Tim Ferriss, this book actually is the book that I read uh, for our work week. So this was the book that got me comfortable with doing a job that's not a job. Okay. Like by reading this book, I figured that, okay, I don't have to go to McKinsey or Microsoft and do that. I can do this also. So like I always knew I could do that, but there was some validation or there was just a situation like, okay, this kind of lifestyle can be built. So this was instrumental in me even starting to think that, hey, listen, I want to do a lifestyle like this. 
other one is Naval Ravikant. So that is this one. So anybody wants life lessons all, I guess that's a lot of wisdom for 300 bucks, <laughs> which you can't get throughout your life otherwise. So these two I recommend. Uh, maybe for 28, 30 year old, yeah, for somebody at business school, sure. And but, what is your all time favorite read to go back to? A book you can read over and over again. Okay, those will be none of these. Uh, there'll be some uh, obscure Alistair MacLean or something. Um, so that was just my comfort, like it's like comfort food. So those are the books I sort of grew up with and uh, like they are very strong characters and they have this situation generally where everything is lost but somebody shows up to sort of change the game. So I have a lot of relatability in terms of my own life where like many times it's bottom but then things sort of work out. Uh, so that's more my comfort zone. This stuff is more intellectual zone. <laughs> so yeah. Rajdeep, how many inquiries do you get every year? Uh, we must be getting about 1500 to 1800. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. So 1500 to some 2000 inquiries, how do you decide whom to work with? Okay, sure. That's not related to the inquiries as such because many people are just figuring out things and not everybody is prepared to sort of start that journey. In terms of who to work with, uh, number one thing is that basically when we talk, the firm and the person should be on the same page in terms of what we're trying to achieve and it should be something feasible. So we are not in the business of just filling up clients and jacking up revenue in that sense. We want it to be a meaningful thing for them and we're investing our own time also. So for us also, if we think something's not possible, then, you know, it's in their best interest also that we don't be involved and we don't charge them like a big fee and stuff like this. Uh, the other thing is if they want to work with us. So we are excited about people who want to work with us because what happens then is that they come in with the sense of trust and then if somebody trusts you, then it's much easier to sort of mentor and guide them rather than them second guessing or taking 20 opinions on everything. Then the process all becomes slow and also it becomes like a too many cooks type of situation. And then also it depends on uh, where we are in terms of our capacity. So in the firm, we nobody works with like typically the range would be 8 to 14 people. Um, at the max, somebody can work with 20 people. So we don't want a situation where uh, somebody is working with 40, 45 people because then we don't think we can apportion the time. Right. So, um, so that is another consideration. So the 15, 20 people that you personally work with, how do you choose them? That is through this process only. Mostly it's... Uh, so firstly, basically most of my time goes into the firm because we are running all these master classes and all these sessions. So typically other firms don't do this. They just do a one on one thing. So that takes away a lot of time. And the idea of that is that we are taking our thought process to all the people who are in the firm. So rather than impact 15 people, we are impacting 150 people. So overall this year, if you see like we had 51 people who gained admission to Wharton and if we were in any other model, then maybe 20 of them could have been helped at that level. But like you certainly can't help 50. So to me, this model is much better. Overall, I think as more people get access to the firm, their level of understanding of what needs to be done goes up. So like I see many clients who have very good profiles and then they say, listen, I'm going to Georgetown or USC, which are all good schools. But when you look at the profile, you feel like, okay, this person could have gone to Kellogg or Booth. So by giving access to more people in the firm that it doesn't happen that people are, firstly, less people are unsuccessful, but even success is like, if you could go to Kellogg and if you're going to X 25th rank school, then I don't classify that as a success. So, so we can reach more people in that way. Yeah. So how should an aspirant decide whom to work with? Okay, so there are a couple of things. So if you are a very quantitative thinker, then you can look at the track record. In the track record, you can look at how many people are getting into the schools that you want to apply to. You can look at the percentages of, let us say we had 51 admits to Wharton, so how many people were in the firm? So let us say 140 or 150. So that's a third. So that ratio is also impressive. If we had 51 admits but 800 people in the firm, then it would not be a signal of our process. 
it could simply be that those 51 are very good. Then if you are more a uh, touchy feely thinker, then you would, like I would still go with quality, but then if you find equal quality, you can look at who you are relating to. Uh, you look at how many people the person works with, you look at what the engagement model is, how much time can they spend. Um, you would look at references and word of mouth. And then finally, you would look at financials. So, if financials are actually a consideration, then you can do some tweaks, etc. If they are not a consideration, then you should just go with the best person you think so. Because overall, you are playing for a much larger thing. Um, also, if you get into like a Harvard or a Stanford, you automatically get this financial aid, which is about $120,000. Um, so, that is a multifold saving. Uh, so, if the counselor can facilitate admission, they also, it also leads to this write off on your loan. So, in that sense, the upside is a lot. Um, so, these are some of the parameters, I guess. Yeah. So, talking about uh, financial requirement, the tweaking, is it affordable to seek uh, an admission consultant's help in India versus? hiring a consultant from outside and is there a perception that going with an admissions consultant is very expensive? Okay, sure. Um, see, admission consulting prices in the US would be at least 50 to 60 percent higher than India. So, let us say if in India somebody charges uh, 7 lakhs, in the US somebody would charge 12. Right now, the question is in my mind is more, hey, listen, what is the value? So, if somebody is able to show that, hey, listen, I charge a lot, but my uh, outcomes are very good, then there is some value attached. But overall, I think the Indian consulting market performs on average better than the US consulting market. Um, and basically, if you want to rationalize results, what you would say is like, let us say that 1000 people at Wharton, from, they'll admit 1000 people and they'll have a class of 820 after yield or something. So, if you look at the American side of this, it would be that they are two third of the people, 660 people are Americans and 340 people are from not India, but from 150 to other countries, right. So, um, in that sense, it is much harder to get an international person and advise them and have them sort of succeed and then they are going to Wharton, etc. Whereas, it's much easier with a US candidate because they are, I mean, they're playing for four times the seats and there's just one country, right? And here, there are 150 countries and it's one fourth the seats available. So, if you put the results in that context, the Indian admissions counseling industry far uh, sort of outperforms the American one. But most people don't rationalize for this lever of difficulty. Uh, but typically, how the Indian consultants think is that if they can help somebody from China or India to make it, then as they go and start helping people from different parts of the world, that's just easier because demand supply is more in a problem in India and China. Yeah. So, do you work with international clients? Uh, yeah, about 20 people a year would be international clients. Um, and I don't think we've worked with an international client so far who's not gone to a top 5 school. So. So, more or less that thing that I was talking about in terms of the demand supply being in their favor sort of plays out in that sense, yeah. So, over these years, you must have come across some exceptional stories. People who made a mark. Can you share some interesting stories with us? Yeah, okay. This is the other thing that I try to do in terms of working with people. I like to work with people who are either in trouble or they have uh, potential but they are not realizing it. Um, or if they are a reapplicant, because like even I was a reapplicant. So, for example, one client of ours was uh, uh, he was an addict. So he had four years of his life which was blanked out, where he was simply living in dumpsters and on the streets. But then he went into rehab, and then he started doing some work, etc. So this person then finally got into Wharton. So, the transition from where he was and what could have happened to what's happened is sort of a big credit to the person. And again, that like that whole thing about stress and all that, like if somehow this person was able to overcome all that and actually, you know, finally succeed, though it was a long journey. 
So we have people like that. We have somebody who uh, can't see and is now doing their MBA from uh, Columbia. Uh, so even when the person went there, even navigating the subway or going to business school was a big challenge because. Um, but then his classmates and all, there was some support system. So there are many people who um, have this transition in their life. So I think those are the most interesting stories. Yeah. There is a lot of uh, there's a trend today I see of people applying together as couples. Sure. Or there is a sibling connection. The elder uh, brother or sister has gone, so yeah. I must also <clears throat> go to an M7. Or sometimes we get calls from people who are distraught because the girlfriend or boyfriend has an offer and the other one doesn't. So have you seen such stories play out? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll come to that. But one thing is, I don't think people should be in a comparative where. Like if one sibling goes to Wharton, the other one is also trying to go to Wharton or something like this. The other one should try to go where they can go. Uh, so that all depends on their individual profiles and experiences. It's not sort of like my classmate went to Harvard. So now even I will go to Harvard because he was just sitting next to me and is the same person and how can it be? And so all these comparatives, I don't think make sense. People should sort of look at their own story and uh, situation in terms of uh, couples going Sure, we have people go to Harvard, Stanford, the Chicago schools, of course, because there you get a benefit of if somebody goes to Kellogg and both you're in the same city. Or even Harvard and Wharton, it's just a one-off flight. So people meet on the weekends. Um, it helps a little also, like if you are gained admission to Wharton and your significant other is on the wait list, I think you have a better chance of making a case than if just is one person on the wait list, right? Um, so it's a little bit of a delta, not a major thing, but sure it could help also, yeah. But does it add to stress? Like you were saying, the comparisons can be harmful. Okay, but there are two things in this. One is comparisons are harmful. That's got nothing to do with couples. It's just everybody. Like if my friend goes to Harvard and now I'm sad because I'm going to Kellogg, it's just uh, like you're not winning that game. You'll go to Kellogg, then your friend will go to McKinsey and you'll go to Bain, then again you'll be sad. Then your friend will become McKinsey's senior partner, you'll become Bain partner, but you'll be sad again. So you'll always be sad only. So so I think that's like a bad cycle to be in, like comparing. That way, like I would be really sad. All my friends are senior partners and all this. So then I'll be really sad that, hey, listen, I'm an admissions consultant and what's happened to me and all. So I think that all doesn't make any sense to me. Um, in the couple scenario, what happens is like somebody gets into Harvard and somebody gets into Wharton. Now the question becomes, listen, should I leave Howard and go to Wharton uh, with my significant other? And people have started doing that. I think there's a rationality that, hey, listen, life continues two years together versus, you know, being apart and all of that. So in that sense, if I get into Wharton and uh, Summer gets into MIT and I get into MIT, then I guess we'll both go to MIT. We wouldn't go for the brand delta or any perception that Wharton is better or stuff like that. But if they both go to different schools, they manage the long distance marriage, do they not get access to two different networks? Uh, yeah. So business school people think like this, that okay, there'll be two networks and all of this. Uh, sort of it comes down to you, but basically you'll have to spend two years of your life. Uh, and many people get married before going to business school. Okay. So to me, it's, I don't know, I'm a... Well, I'm a creative thinker, but I'm also a traditionalist. So basically what it means is like if I'm married for 10 years and that's happening, it's fine. But if I'm just married, then I don't want my first two years to be separated. So I also guess where you are in the journey. Uh, but most of these people are early in their journey. So it's a significant uh, sort of compromise to make in my mind. Uh, I would always go for the family situation over and the brand delta is not so much. Like it's not like if you go to MIT or if you go to Wharton, your life will significantly change. I think it'll be the same. Actually, I think most people don't realize that. There's too much emphasis on Harvard versus Wharton, Wharton versus Kellogg. It's all uh, deltas. Ultimately, if you get into the M7, it's up to you and what you're going to do. I don't think it matters so much. Yeah. What about uh, people who, you know, the both the partners, they don't want to pursue an MBA. Only one of them does. So uh, is it possible for international students to take their spouses with them? Um, and how can a spouse of somebody who's pursuing an MBA support the whole journey? <laughs> that I don't have much idea. I guess you couldn't go on a J1 or something like this. 
um but then i guess most people would want to find a job so what would happen is somebody will say okay if you're going to boston then i have to find a job there and then i don't know what the people's ability to find a job there is so um so sure, that's a more difficult situation if you're married and one wants to go and one wants to stay in india etc personally i wouldn't i'm not that career oriented to okay actually this is a transition my father went to nigeria and my sister and me grew up in delhi and he had to go because he had to build his career for us that's fine like i don't feel that he shouldn't have gone or something like this but nowadays i think it's changed i, I think if you say hey listen we are all moving now uh, because i have got a job there then everybody will have their own thing like people will be oh i am a network here kids will be like oh i am a school here oh i am my friends in the building so i think that's changed over the years like um, so for me it's very hard to uproot and say okay we'll do something now we are more or less here technically in admissions consulting i you could go to spain or portugal and just work from there right you don't need to be anywhere and all of that uh, so some people do that kind of lifestyle like akshat sivastav uh, he's traveling his kids travel with him i guess and there's some homeschooling and stuff like that but i think you have to take that leap of faith then not everybody can take it so kudos to people who do it um, but we are fairly traditionalist in that sense <laughs> so we travel but we stick around here only yeah so all these um, people you are talking about somebody who overcame uh, an addiction and from dumpster to whatn someone overcame a challenge uh, with eyesight to be able to study further uh, how do you think they went about conquering the inner demons how did they overcome stress okay that i have no idea i guess that all depends on them um see one thing is the only part we have to play in this is uh, validation so actually one thing what happens is i think the tuning of how people look at different stories is very different so for example there's a client who was in prison and then when the person comes and talks to me my tuning is like okay that's fine and then other people's tuning is like oh you were in prison how can you apply and my tuning is like no you can only more or less apply because you were in prison like if you were not in prison then you would just you still have some professional achievements and also so it's a lens right some people think hey listen that's a no go and i think okay that's the story the fact that you could go to prison and then let's say you became a product manager at google so that is a in my mind you're getting in like there's no way you're not getting in in many people's mind oh no so it's just a lens you take to it i guess yeah so in our job is more validation that this can happen and giving the person some self confidence demons and all they have to manage themselves yeah so what do you think should be an aspirant's ideal timeline sure so the timeline i guess uh, starts okay the thing is some key decisions uh, dictate what will happen what is your job did you change a job uh, do you have any extra curriculars or community involvement uh, did you do the gmat or are you rushing to do it so i think a year before people should start figuring out all this and that allows them to come into april or may of the year they are applying in and then they can apply by september right but basically people shouldn't make not mistakes but decisions that are not optimal in the couple of years before because otherwise when you come to apply you come with that right so so i think there are two things one is your planning and then your execution can be done in 6 to 8 months you were telling me about this butcher who got into duke what was that story uh, so this person was uh, basically yeah it was a business where they used to raise and also run a butcher shop so overall actually i think in india there are many people who have the ability to do more than what they think so for example like if i go to lunch i always i find there's one person who's serving and basically his job is at that point of a waiter but they speak very well they speak very confidently and i always think that hey listen if this person was in an mba interview he would crack it right so i think in india there are many people who 
because of some thought process or because of their circle or because of what they've seen they're in places where they could do much better but they simply are not aware um so there are many such people actually and in the us in terms of the business school uh, hierarchy like if you look at the top 30 business schools uh, if let us say i am work in a cafe coffee day and then let us say i get to go to mendoza or georgetown or something like i think it's a big deal like i you know in terms of what exposure you'll get and what will happen now the question is can i get there sure because i've done an undergrad and let us say i am done average and let us say 3 4 years i have managed a restaurant or something and let us say i was 7 10 on my gmat which i may have to study to sort of get that but these are not exceptional ass so i think here there is like a lot of people who could sort of just do much better and then they have to have the inclination of all that of course um but like this you could find many people yes so do you think this is changing um is the applicant pool the types of applicants the number of applicants is that changing well the number of applicants maybe is growing like after covid it definitely grew uh now maybe it's stabilized a little um we see like a small pool 1500 people call us so it's not like 30000 people call us um so that pool is very hard to see any fluctuations like like we never think the year is hard if somebody says oh this year was very hard lot of wait lists we like no okay uh so we don't see macro trends because we work in this bubble of about 1000 people um but overall i think the there are both sides like some people think the mba is there to stay some people think the mba will be are uh, disrupted etc um so with the pandemic or with the changes that have happened how has your approach evolved yes yeah, so actually once we went to more uh, becoming a firm we decided to actually become a firm so what that means is that many firms say we are a firm but the firm doesn't do anything in that right like uh so let us say i go and join firm x and they say listen you will work with consultant a so basically you will work with consultant a but firm x is not doing anything after the initial relationship set up so in that sense we are a firm because we throughout the year run our program where all the partners of the firm are participating doing master classes doing sessions etc so in that sense the firm also does something of course you also have a consultant um but in that sense the our firm we deliver our ip ourselves like for example let us say if it's mckinsey and there's a case going on so a team of 3 or 4 whatever it is will go there but it is not like mckinsey has gone there right um so in our case we try to plug for the gap that sure you get a case team but you also get the partners all together and on an active basis not once in a while um so that's what we are trying to set up and that is our quality control also we are trying to see that okay everybody in the firm is having a, a similar experience in terms of the input of course the journeys are all customized according to whatever their stories are uh, but that they are getting the similar level of sort of response thought process uh, network and all those things so that's how we are trying to do it yeah. so rajdeep you know you known to be a very generous person and um clients uh, fellow consultants everyone shares how much you help them so while you may be so generous in helping others with your time with your expertise does it happen that people behave sometimes in an entitled manner and how do you deal with that so in these evaluations we spend like 45 minutes with people so that's actually counseling now of course that's 45 minutes of your life it's time out of your kids etc so then people who are coming in for that should uh, sort of also come prepared and they should be serious it shouldn't be like a test that okay let me go and test this etc right and then they're talking to everybody so if you take five counselors then it's 3 hours of people's time right so i think that's the <clears throat> other thing in terms of entitlement which i think it comes from aspiration like many times we have people who may say hey listen Kellogg is my backup. So in this, there's a strange dynamic that I'm a Kellogg alum, so it's like, like I'm getting this message at the back of my head that oh, 
so I got the backup. <laughs> but apart from that dynamic, it's the situation where it's too high expectation. It's like a top five school in the world and all of that, right? So, so that expectation actually doesn't help in any way. Like you would do the work, and then if, if Kellogg was your backup, you'll come to know, and you'll get into Harvard. And if Kellogg's not your backup, you'll get dinged, and something else will happen to you. So this whole aspect of before doing the work. Having some notions is something that I don't sort of get. Like the way to figure out whether it's your backup or not is you would get in with a full scholarship and then you'd be like, oh, this was too easy. And then you'll say, okay, let's, what about Stanford then or something, right? So, but yeah, this is from uh, both sides, I guess. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the Indian admissions consulting community does one thing good is that they spend a lot of time with people where they are not charging anything. And in fact, the Americans also do this. So people say, hey, listen, that is BD, but sure, it is a lot of time and hours people are spending in free counseling. I can't go to a doctor and say, hey, listen, 30 minutes I'm coming, you know, my knee is paining, you know, what do you think? I have a little bit here. I have to pay the fee, right? Like, I, I think people don't realize this. Like, so here, all these people are basically just doing free work for you. So, so yeah, if something happens where somebody is irritated with somebody or something, I think that should be a write-off because there's so much volume of free work going in. Um, so yeah. What do you think of the career coaching landscape in India? And would you like to play a larger role in it? What do you think trainers, coaches should actually be doing? Yeah, the landscape is built now actually. Uh, there are a lot of people who come back and do this as a viable thing. And then the two aspects to it. I think any landscape that develops should be more in uh, the interest of the student. Um, so in that sense, like whoever does this job needs to do it seriously because at the end of the day, it's a big inflection point for the student and in their lives, whether they make it, don't make it or what happens, right? Um, so sure, while the barrier of entry is low, like anybody can just become an admissions consultant. That's the perception, but like anybody can't just become a doctor. So somehow or a lawyer, right? But in this, maybe there's a perception that, okay, if I did an MBA, I can also be an all. And maybe you can, as long as you're committed to sort of having the student's interest and putting in the time. So I think that's very important as the landscape's uh, growing. In India, we are fairly fragmented. Like basically, it's more everybody does their silo. So there's a loss of uh, information in that. Like you don't get any big block of information. You just get the silo and whatever the person in the silo knows. Um, so it's a little different from big firms like the US. Like, like at, maybe Indian counselors are the best. But when you talk about firms, then like MBA mission would be very good, right? Because basically it's a pool of resources. And people coming together, 10 people coming together can of course outpace any one person doing anything individually. So I think we've developed on the individual counselor model. Now maybe in some time there are firm things. The other thing is I think the Indian industry is very constrained to India for some reason. <clears throat> so there's this mental thing where a counselor in the US will think that, hey, listen, my playing field is the world and also students in India. But counselors in India will think that, oh, it's students in India and they don't have any say or any attempt or any information to anybody in the US. So I think the industry needs to go more to a global level <coughs> where it's not just, like if you're good, you're good. It's not got anything to do with geography and stuff like that. So those evolutions will come slowly, I guess. Yeah. So in the innings so far, what's been your greatest learning? <laughs> My greatest learning? So, um, <clears throat> actually, I guess someone, I don't remember whether I told somebody or somebody told me, but basically it was that, hey, listen, if you're cleaning a toilet, then you clean it well. If you're making a chair, then you make it well. So to me, it was a very fundamental thing that don't be too tied up on what you're doing, but just do it very well. So my MBA consulting situation was also a thing that, okay, if you're top 10 in anything in the world, you'll do well. So I think that learning that, hey, listen, whatever it is you want to do, that's up to you and up to your skill set and interest. But then you should do that well and not bother about what other people are doing or what's happening and stuff like that. I guess something like that. 
on that note, I want to thank you so much for taking out so much time. My um, pleasure. <laughs> your fans are going to love hearing all about the behind the scene, the making of Rajdeep. I think we'll get ten views, but we'll find out. <laughs> okay, thank you.